All right, good. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, thank you. So we have those unique services that we provide, and um, and also we we try to. Uh, in our local clinics, we try to address such the huge, such a huge need of faith-based counseling. Um, and so, um, if anybody's looking for a job, you probably want to find me afterwards and talk a little bit. <laughs> uh, we we just cannot keep up. I was just sharing earlier today just the amount of people that come in that need help. Uh, it's I'm a little afraid. I'm a little afraid that we cannot take care of people. We cannot meet the needs. I mean, San Bernardino, largest county in the, in the country. I mean, we just cannot meet, I, I, I can't hire enough people. You can't, we just can't do it. And so here's where it's so important to have, like to bridge the faith community and the mental health community together. Um, Chaplain Cobb talked about how we are a whole person. We're not just physical. Beings. We're not just spiritual beings. We're not just uh, psychological, uh, emotional beings, but we are. We're three parts of a person, and so we got it. When we when you treat somebody, uh, you got to treat the mental, the physical, and the spiritual aspect of an individual. Um, I, one particular quote that I'm very fond of is: uh, "Be careful of psychiatrists because they'll convince you that your religious your religion has driven you nuts." Um, and so uh, there are people, I mean, yeah, you know, like if you go see the wrong person, uh, that's the reason why faith people are scared of going to get help uh, if within the community with us is because they know this, you know, that we're going to tell them that, you know, well, your religion is the problem. That's the problem right there. You know, uh, one of the things I really try to teach, and we have uh, providers who are not faith-based, but we treat everybody no matter what their, their background is. Uh, we have Arabic-speaking therapists, uh, Spanish-speaking therapists, English-speaking therapists, and so we have people from all different backgrounds who can come and get help uh, for the simple fact that this is not just an isolated issue that only Christians face, but all people face, all right? So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, people in the Bible, for example, uh, that have had uh, mental health disorders. And of course, we can go down the go down the list here for so many, uh, but I'm going to uh, focus on one in particular, and we'll talk a little bit about three of them. If you look, the Bible itself is accepted by Christians and others all over the world as the word of God. It, it, it remains relevant throughout time uh, that it is forever established as the message of love, hope, and restoration. And although there are various interpretations uh, of the exact text of the Bible, uh, I mean, people like scholars and lay people arrive at their own different interpretations of the Bible, the Bible is not just a religious text, all right? Uh, it is also a historical account of the creation of man from the Israelites in the Old Testament uh, to the birth of Christianity in the New Testament. Um, and in this course, we'll attempt to correlate behavior patterns from various biblical figures from the Old Testament and the New Testament with proven psychological diagnosis today. Okay, so this is one of those subjects where people really, they really like this guy. Oh, wow, he had a, so you, yeah, no, you're not the only one. <laughs> you're not the only one with bipolar. No, you're not. You're not the only one with depression. You're not the only one who had thoughts of suicide. No, you're not. And it's really astounding when you can share and sort of bridge this with people of faith. How many counselors, how many, how many professionals are in here today, right? Profession All right, so you know the challenge of trying to, to marry up that faith with what we do scientifically, okay? And so we hope that this will, this will help you out a little bit. So number one, we'll talk a little bit about Jacob and Joseph. Jacob and Joseph, uh, a biblical case study of post-traumatic stress disorder authored by Dr. Uh, Berman. Uh, he's a PsyD uh, uh, therapist 
And in his article, he examines the biblical narrative relating to the, the Hebrew patriarch, Jacob. Uh, in the book of Genesis, the evidence of PTSD was first, first established, uh, defined by the criteria of the DSM. Uh, a close, literal reading of this particular text here supports a provisional diagnosis of PTSD for Jacob because of how he lost his son. And if you look at sort of the, the issues that Jacob faced after um, um, Jacob, after he lost jo Joseph, how it affected him, I mean, he went into isolation, uh, he was aggressive with his other children, uh, and just go down the list there. If you do a study of Jacob and Joseph, you pull out the DSM-5, you'll be able to see like boom, 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 boom. So one of our earliest diagnosis of PTSD. No, it is not a new thing. I think Dr. Uh, Scott touched on it today. I mean, it is prevalent everywhere you look. As a matter of fact, our general surgeon for California, I am so happy that uh, she is doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job. I don't care what you think about forest politics of concern, she is on it. I mean, we're talking about this, we do it in our clinic. Uh, we've always done the long version of the ACE, but now we have a short version that we do that's only about 10 questions. And if you look at the data behind that, like if you score out of 10, at least four on there, we already know that there is a high propensity of you having a comorbid disorder. It's not only a physical problem, you know, medical condition, but also a psychological medical condition also, all right, that will sort of go together. Uh, for example, hypertension and uh, anxiety or diabetes and depression. So, and if you look, if you go higher than that on that ACE, and she is all, this particular lady is all, the Surgeon General, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say lady, uh, the Surgeon General is all about early screening and taking this information because if you look at children in our neighborhoods today, let's just talk about, we're not even gonna go outside of California. <laughs> we're not gonna go to St. Louis. <laughs> we're, not gonna go to, we're not gonna go to Chicago. We're gonna talk about right here in like Los Angeles, okay? The trauma that they face every single day when we talk about PTSD. So uh, the Jacob's provisional diagnosis with chronic PTSD following the disappearance, the disappearance and the apparent death of his favorite son, Joseph. Uh, again, it's one of the earliest ones. It involved both aggression and maltreatment, and it supports the validity and the relevance of PTSD across culture and time, uh, as early as 1500 BCE, all right, when we talk about PTSD. So it is not a new thing, right? Not a new thing at all. Number two. Talk a little bit about David. David was, uh, was troubled and uh, in a battle of deep despair. As a matter of fact, in many, and I know we've all sort of touched on these today, but in many of the Psalms, he writes his anguish uh, and loneliness and his fear of his enemy in his heart's cry over sin and the guilt he struggled with because of it. We also see his huge grief and loss in his sons in 2 Samuel 12, chapter, chapter 12, verse 15 to 23, and 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 18 to 33. In other places, David's honesty with his own weakness gives hope to us who are struggling today. That you can talk about a man after God's own heart. You talk about a man who would, David was one of the most, if I can, one of the most jacked up dudes you ever could find, all right? But this was a man after God's own heart. He had a heart for God. I mean, this is somebody who God took notice of. But as you can look and see here, though, but I mean, he has some serious issues, though, serious issues. And that's why I think we can find a lot of comfort uh, when we're going through stuff if you just go to the book of Psalms. Matter of fact, when people ask me how to pray, I go, we well, get the book of Psalms out. Matter of fact, I can remember. When I, uh, when I first came to the Lord, I had a couple sisters, missionaries in the church, and uh, I called myself, you know, trying to pray. You know, nobody taught me how to pray. Uh, so I called myself praying, and uh, I remember one of the little sisters there at Lobby Stone came over to me, and she got down next to me and said, baby, you got to get the Bible open. You got, to, you got to read the word of God and just say it over and over again. And we know meditation. That's exactly what meditation is. So, you know, it's like, oh, okay, then I'm reading the Psalms. And there's so much comfort when you read the book of Psalms when you're going through stuff, all right? Because it's written by somebody who's been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. 
all right? So, um, oh, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. I, I may let you know, I don't know. Go to the next slide. <laughs> no, go, no, I'm, I'm good. So I'm talking first. Okay, okay, good. I'm talking first. Uh, and then <laughs> there is Elijah. Uh, he was discouraged, weary, and afraid. And after great spiritual victories over the prophet Baal, this mighty man of God feared and ran for his life as far away as he could from the threats of Jezebel. How many are familiar with that story? And there in the desert, he sat down and prayed, defeated and worn. He said this, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am not better than my ancestors. We're talking about somebody with suicidal thoughts. We're talking about somebody who, who literally who, who prayed, who knew God, who watched God perform miracles from his prayers. I mean, was used mightily of God. He was Elijah, right? And now we find him in a desert, lonely place, talking about God, I wish I was dead. So it, suicidal ideation is not a new thing. I mean, not a new thing at all. Uh, second, First Kings chapter 19, verse 4 is where you can find that story at. And Jonah uh, was angry and wanted to run away from God. And after God called Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach to the people, he fled as far as away as he could. And after a storm at the sea, being swallowed by a giant fish and then saved and given a second chance, he obeyed God. He preached the message of God to Nineveh. God's mercy reached out to the people who turned to him. But instead of rejoicing, Jonah got mad. <laughs> <laughs> Jonah got mad. As a matter of fact, Jonah chapter 4, verse 3 says, Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than it is to live. And these are people who, are, who were used of God. This is, these, are, these are not sinners. <laughs> these are not people who made a bunch of mistakes in their life and just, you know, these are people who walked with God, who knew God, who had a relationship with God. And they're talking about they wish they were dead, all right? So this is not something new. It is not something new, all right? Uh, even after God reached out to Jonah again with great compassion, he responded, I'm angry enough to die. Jonah 4 and 9 said, I'm angry enough to die. And if we were to look at Jonah's life, I mean, very easy, we could, we could diagnose him. He, he, had, he had an explosive. He, he was a very angry man, very angry man. And depressed. It is widely accepted that Saul, the king of Israel, had a mental disorder. And this is when I talk about, whenever I give this particular presentation, this is one of the ones where it's very family. You can go find literature and reviews everywhere on Saul with his bipolar, all right? Which is what we're going to talk about today, his bipolar disorder. Um, so, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23. Uh, it is, we just, we're going to assume just from the story here that he had uh, some form of depression because even the Bible says that when you read the King James Version uh, in, in English, when you, in everyday English, it says that after that, whenever he had depression from God, Whenever the bad depression from God tormented Saul, David got up his harp and played. And that would calm Saul down, and he would feel better, and his moodiness lifted. Let me read this scripture again, because I, first Samuel 16 and 23. After that, whenever the bad depression from God, and I think some places in the Bible, uh, if you look at the actual Hebrew word there, it says the spirit of evil or the evil spirit from God. It's what it says, the evil spirit from God tormented Saul, and David got up his heart and played, and that will calm Saul down, and he will feel better, and his moodiness left. All right? Not well known are two other passages that we'll talk a little bit about that suggest that he not only suffered from depression, but there was a manic component to his depression. All right? So, uh, matter of fact, thus, shortly after being anointed the king by the prophet Samuel, 
But before he assumed the throne, Saul gets lost in the woods while searching for some lost donkeys. And there he meets a band of prophets. This is in 10 and 10. Uh, when they were going from Gilbreth, a band of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God possessed him, and he fell into a prophetic frenzy along with them, verse 11, and when all who knew him before saw that he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, what has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets now? I mean, this is, this is odd behavior for a king of Israel <laughs> to be now. I'm first, we're talking about, let's just back, back up a little bit. A royal king of Israel, all right, uh, out in the desert looking for lost, uh, out in the woods, I'm sorry, looking for lost donkeys, and all of a sudden he comes upon these, this group of men who are prophesying, and I'll break this down just a little bit more, and when we say prophesying, we think of, you know, especially, you know, they were prophesying the word of the Lord, prophesying, and, you know, but if you talk to somebody who has bipolar too, they can prophesy too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you find somebody, you find delusional people, they prophesy, uh, you know, but that's not of God, <laughs> you know, but they can prophesy too. And that's what's happening here is that, I mean, even the people who saw this, they look and they see the king uh, prophesying. And they're like, who is this? What is wrong with him? Because it's such odd behavior. It was just not a part of who he was and what he did on a regular basis, okay? So um, verse 13 says, when this prophetic frenzy had ended, he went home. Uh, and this passage describes a brief episode where Paul, I'm sorry, Saul behaved out of character and was in a state of frenzy or uh, what we call a, prophes a prophetic ecstasy, almost a high in sort of a sense is what it was, okay? And the second episode of a possible, possible mania, when you look through the life of Saul, uh, we find toward the end of Saul's life. Uh, and t toward the end of his reign, when in a jealous rage, and we're all very familiar with this, where he's chasing David down and trying to kill David. As a matter of fact, one particular passage of the Bible says that he took a dagger and he threw a dagger, is what he did, trying to kill David. And then you turn around, and all of a sudden he's offering now his daughter to David, saying, I'm sorry, forgive me. You know, that love-hate relationship, and we see that a lot when you think about bipolar patients. You know bipolar patients. You know, you have sort of that love-hate relationship with them. Um, as a matter of fact, it says here that uh, Saul and his army were pursuing David across the desert uh, and uh, actually found him in a place first. This is chapter 19, verse 23. It says, he went toward Nail Arama, and the spirit of God came upon him, and he was going, and he fell into a prof prophetic frenzy uh, until he came to Rama. All right, stripped off his clothes and fell before the prophet Samuel is what he did. And again, we're talking about a king. This is a, this is a man of raw who was well known. This was the king of all Israel is what this was, all right? And even before the man of God, the prophet Samuel, I mean, this is, he laid there naked all day and all night, the Bible says. And therefore it is said, is Saul among the prophets? Like, the, cause these particular prophets that we talk about here, when I use this word, it is really sort of a, a if I could in everyday, in our everyday language that we use lingo, you know, these were some special people and, uh, you know, that hung out and sort of were together in the woods who would just get together and just sort of, you know, they would rip off all their clothes, walk around naked, and then they'd be out there just, just talking, just babbling, just nonsense is what they would be doing. And so here again we find Saul again doing the exact same thing, and now even before the prophet Samuel. And when I say prophet here, I'm talking about the prophet, the man of God, all right? <laughs> I want to make sure, we, <laughs> make sure we, 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 we separate that off. Both episodes of mania uh, may have occurred in the presence of others who also went into states of excitement, suggesting some kind of epidemic of hysteria is what it was. Uh, thus, in the first episode, it is the prophet Saul's encounter 
And in the second episode, his soldiers actually with him fell into the same kind of frenzy. Yeah, same kind of frenzy. Uh, Saw strips off all his clothes, uh, and and if you look at the diagnosis, uh, bipolar, you'll see, we'll talk a little bit about that. As a matter of fact, go to the first slide here. Um, I put it in here, and I know you can't really see it, and I tried to work with it, um, but it's the, uh, how many are familiar with the MQD? I know our staff is, but how many, the MDQ, the Mood Disorder Questionnaire? It's a, it's an easy self-reported assessment that you can use that you can give somebody. And of course, it's not a diagnostic tool, but of course, if they score seven or more and it's been a problem for them when they score seven or more on this, then you certainly should be sitting down with them doing a thorough, you know, evaluation on, you know, the possibility of a diagnosis of bipolar. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I could, let me go to my slide here. I'll be able to see, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those things in there as well. We talk about saw. I want you to be able to see um, what some of those things are. Um, so you feel so good. It says, "Has there ever been a period of time when you were not your usual self?" And, and you answer yes or no. And then the first one says, uh, "You felt so good or hyper that other people thought you were not your normal self, and you were so hyper that you got into trouble." Mm -hmm. Paul, I mean Saul, we can, I'm, I'm sorry, um, we can easily say uh, for this particular man right here, this particular thing, yes, all right? Uh, you felt much more self-confident than your usual self. The answer is just simple yes or no. Uh, you, were, you had less much sleep than usual, and you felt that you really didn't miss it. And when you actually do this study on Saul's life, you'll find he had disrupted sleep patterns. He would go days without sleeping, which sort of caused that, you know, if you, your melatonin and serotonin is not working the way that it should work, then you sort of get that, thank you, you sort of get that um, incoherent speech and sort of that delusional thought pattern going on. Uh, and I've had people, and then once you get them sleep, they go right back down to their baseline. But missing sleep like that is, is, is very, very harmful, very harmful. We need sleep. And so if you study his life, you'll see where he had a lot of disrupted sleep patterns. Uh, it says, I tended to overreact to situations. I mean, literally, David was, didn't do, he just heard the story that David, as a little guy, uh, wasn't even a man yet, was going to come and uh, this is somebody who could help him with his uh, depression, and so he was going to play for him. And then he also got wind that he had been anointed by Samuel as the next king of Israel, all right? And so now you find now this hatred for David, the same guy who can help you with your depression, who can help you with your particular situation, and sort of now it just goes back and forth. And so if you look at the MDQ, it says here, I experienced, I tended to overreact to situations. I can tell you, looking at his life, he overreacted to a lot of situations as the king of Israel. Uh, I experienced trembling in my hand. I felt that I was using a lot of nervous energy. I can tell you that just the first manic episode of being out in the wilderness, and that's a lot of nervous energy there. Um, and, and what he did there from taking off his clothes, rolling around naked all day and all night, and not even the, not even the prophet Samuel could even talk him down and bring him back to his senses. As a matter of fact, he had so much power over the people that were around him that even his soldiers joined in with him. It's like, oh, well, well, the king's doing it, so, you know, yeah, everybody get naked then and start rolling around on the ground. So, I mean, these were people who, you know, all right, so uh, I found myself getting easily agitated, and we know that that's definitely a case if you have a, a diagnosis of this sort right here. Uh, there's a lot of anger with this particular diagnosis. Um, I found it difficult to relax. I felt down. Oh, this is a DAS. I'm sorry. This is a DAS. This is the DAS. Um, this is that, but it is, it's, it's, it's pretty close to it though. It's pretty close to it. Um, you were much more active and did many more things than usual. You were much more social or outgoing than usual. For example, you telephone friends in the middle of the night. Um, you were much more interested in sex than usual. We know that this particular diagnosis right here, um, it's just, it's, it's a part of the diagnosis is what it is, that you'll find that a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, promiscuous, um, and you were much more interested in sex, 
You did things that were unusual for you and other people might have thought you were excessive, foolish, or risky. Uh, you were spending money uh, and it got you in trouble. All right, and so these are some of the things right here that you can just do a thorough, not a thorough, but just a general overview, yes or no. And of course, if you have seven or more on the MDQ, then this is enough information right here for you to probably refer them or to either uh, have another conversation with them and do a thorough evaluation for a diagnosis of bipolar. All right. Um, let me get that back. Go to the next slide. So we're talking about bipolar. It's finished talking about David here. Um, I'm sorry, finished talking about Saul. All right. Any questions so far? Another episode, uh, another component, I, I should say, of Saul's uh, condition was the paranoia that came along with this with him. All right. I mean, if you pull out the DSM and you look at Saul's life, you can literally go right down the list and go boom, boom, boom. Go to the next slide here for me. I'll show you some of those. For a diagnosis of bipolar one, a disorder is necessary to meet the following criteria for a manic episode. The manic episode must have been preceded by and may be followed by hypomanic or major depressive disorders, the ups and downs so that the swings in the relationship or the swings in the mood. Excuse me, next slide. And for a manic episode, you don't have to have me read it, but this is how we determine like, you know, one or two, although it can be some variations in there. We, we talk about the hospitalization. Go back there just for a second. I don't read that fast. I don't know if y'all do. <laughs> I don't read that fast. <laughs> but lasting at least a week and present most of the day, nearly every day, uh, and any duration if hospitalization is necessary. Okay? Go to the next one for me. And during the periods of mood disturbance and increased energy um, are more of the following symptoms, the mood is only irritable or present to a significant degree or represent a noticeable change from usual behavior. And this is my rule of thumb right here for diagnosing here is that so we all have some of these characteristics, right? You, you experience some of this and doesn't necessarily mean that you're bipolar. You can have some of these characteristics, but that doesn't mean that you have bipolar. So the rule of thumb here is that you become wary or concerned only if it interferes or impedes your normal functioning. Now, when you can't hold a relationship with anybody anymore, that's a problem. When you can't get up and go to work, when you can't take care of yourself, when you can't manage your money, that's when it's a problem and you should be probably talking to a professional, all right? And nine times out of 10, the individual who is going through this won't see this as a problem. So this is where it takes us as family members and friends and loved ones that we notice this and that we begin to vocalize and try to get the help that they need, okay? Any questions, guys? I know I'm, I'm going fast here. All right, so paranoia uh, has also been proposed as a possible explanation for Saul's peculiar behavior. Saul's acute fear of David's uprising of his kingship led him to pursue him frantically. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was reading one professor, uh, uh, Joshua said that a renowned doctor with expertise in the history of medicine pointed out the hormonality uh, anomalies in the behavior of King Saul belong to the domain of psychiatry. And this is what he had to say. He said, he cited that specifically, the vigorous reactions and changings, changes in his nature from him being so kind and then being so, I mean, he had a vengeance to want to destroy and kill him with everything that was in him. And so just that stock movement right there of his personality was enough right here to say that he should have been seen a psychiatrist. He should have been seen a psychiatrist. And you guys, you, you've seen that sort of that love-hate where people love you but they hate you at the same time. You know, they want you to go as sort of like a BPD, you know, a borderline personality disorder. They love you but they hate you. Uh, they want you to stay and they want you to go all at the same time. You look at Paul, I mean, you look at Saul, I keep saying Paul, sorry. 
You look at King Saul, King Saul, that's how he was with David. That's how he was, like he needed him in order when he played the harp, like we said earlier, he soothed him and he sort of calmed that beast within him. Uh, and then, uh, you know, he flipped, you know, just the next day or so, as a matter of fact, one particular story says it's about three days in between, David went from offering uh, his wife, I'm sorry, his daughter to David as a wife to then trying to kill him. I mean, literally taking his whole army and chasing him down into caves is what he was doing. So the pathology um, here for Saul, uh, afflicted uh, by intense responses and drastic fluctuations in his behavior and his character. While paranoia may fall into the domain of psychiatry, it is not primarily a feature that changes uh, uh, when we talk about some of the same criteria, uh, namely Saul's extreme, um, let me see here, his extreme variations in behavior, you rule out any possibilities of his negative thinking being a result of major depressive disorder. Because when you first, like I say, you can find lots of studies on Saul and do your own. Well, when we first look at, yes, there is some depression there. There is some depression there uh, for Saul, but we know that depression is a part of the bipolar disorder, all right? But what sets that apart is those, that mania is what sets that apart. So you can have depression and you can have a diagnosis of major depressive, but you won't have the ups and downs of the mood. If you're depressed, you're just sort of depressed. And you have that situational depression, then you have what I call that clinical depression. So situational depression, if you're depression, you lose somebody, something significant, something big happens in your life, and typically that depression sort of goes away with time. But then you have more of that clinical depression, uh, and this goes back to the age, this goes back to as a child. I mean, we have what we call latent, patent, and blatant issues. So for example, your latent issues, it's getting warm. So those latent issues are those things that we don't see. You, you can't put your, you, you don't even know that they're there. But uh, we're born this way. Uh, we've had stuff happen very early on in our life. And, but you're OK, though. You, you survive. You, you, uh, humans are resilient. They'll get, they'll, get, they'll get through. All right, those are those latent issues. But then when we don't have treatment, we don't address and we don't take care of that stuff, those latent issues, because life continues to happen, those latent issues then move to what we call patent. So now those patent issues are where we look at people and go, you know what? He a little odd, but he all right though. He all right. He all right. He'll he'll, he'll, he'll be okay. Yeah, you know, just, just quirkiness, you know, about them. But they okay though. They good people. You don't have no problems out of them. And then life continues to happen. Life continues to it continues to come. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, hard and strong. Those latent issues that we could not see, we could not even identify, we didn't even know were there, are now exacerbated, and they move from latency to patent. And now you have living in, and I'm telling you, we are not, it's not getting any better. Like, I, I'm no prophet, but it's not getting, I, just, if I'm a scientist, by nature I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist who happens to believe God. I believe that science proves God and God supports science, all right? So they go hand in hand if you ask me. I'm a scientist by nature. I'm telling you what the science shows, that we're not getting better. They're, we're not getting better. It's only getting worse. And if you look at society around us, you have those latent issues that people are born with that have now moved to Peyton and every single day and you know we don't we just talked about this we don't have enough providers they're not getting the health that they need they are being exacerbated even more they're moving from latent to patent to blatant and those blatant issues are where you look at somebody okay you got a problem you got a problem your mama knows you got a problem everybody around you knows you got a problem like there's a problem now okay there's a serious problem and it's because those issues have moved from latent to patent to blatant and like now it is Everybody knows that this is a problem and we got to do something, okay? So with this particular psychiatrist, he was looking here at, Paul's, at Saul's, King Saul's life, and he was saying, okay, yeah, there's some depression here. We, we know we can recognize some of that depression. But as time went on, what happened was that Saul 
actually, if you were a part of uh, Reverend uh, Pastor Claiborne's uh, presentation, he talked a little bit about this. There are some mental illnesses that are a direct result of sin, and there are some, as a matter of fact, all mental illness, the fall of man, uh, you know, it's just because the fall of man, you know, there's, that's how sin enters into the world. That's how we have problems. That's how we have cancer. That's why we die. It's because of the fall of man. However, not everybody who experiences something like a mental illness doesn't mean that they have sin in their life, doesn't mean that they're a sinner, it doesn't mean that, you know, that they have a problem or anything like that. Sometimes stuff just happens. And if you look Saul, if you review King Saul's life, you find where he stepped outside of the will of God as the king is what he did. And the Bible says that he took upon himself because uh, the prophet Samuel wasn't doing or moving as fast as he wanted him to move. So he took it upon himself to do this. And then this is where we see where Saul is actually tormented, the Bible says. Uh, he was sent this evil spirit is what happened. All right? So depression could explain Saul's frequent melancholy, but it cannot explain Saul's moments of heightened mood his hyperactiveness, his aggressive interpersonal uh, reactions, and toward the end of King Saul's life, he descends into a state of paranoia, uh, which culminates into the death by suicide by uh, following the defeat of the Philistines, all right? Another one of those suicidal ideation is very, very common with people uh, who have this diagnosis. You'll see it a lot, especially when it's unmentioned. This has got to be one of the most difficult diagnosis to treat to really manage this particular one is uh, we see we treat a lot of patients who have bipolar in our clinic and I gotta tell you it's a lot of work it's a lot of this is not one you can do easily with medication because what happens once you start to feel good you stop taking the medication. <laughs> it's what you do, all right? And we talk about having, uh, when, we, when we're treating and we have a program for, for patients who suffer from uh, bipolar, like they need very strict, you know, structured life, their diet, all those things need to be taken into place. Them having sort of like a schedule of, you know, what to do, when to do it is very important. Meditation, mindfulness is another good component. And if they need medicine, because most of them do, most of them do, especially in the beginning, we have been able to manage to get some of them off of medication. I think we have a, probably about 50 50 is what we have that actually get off of medication. But it takes about two years. 24 months to get somebody stabilized. And that's even with medication when you talk about bipolar. Even with medication. And this is somebody who has a very strong support system in place, somebody who's sort of gone through the psychoeducation that, okay, no, this is not a one-time thing, this is, this is real, this is something you'll have to live with the rest of your life. And once you get them to a point where they recognize that, uh, then you can start doing that stabilization treatment where you can train them to not where they don't have to take the medication. But otherwise, this is one of those really, really, really difficult uh, diagnoses to treat. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's, I, I thank you so much. Let's talk about that a little bit because I, I think that you, I always tell people, you are not your diagnosis because people come in and go, I'm bipolar. I say, no, you're not bipolar. What's your name? That's not your name. That's not who you are. It may be a part, it may be a piece of you. It may be something that you have, but it's not, I don't, you don't introduce a high, I'm cancer. Hi, I'm diabetes mellitus type two. You don't do that, you know? But if you, I'm schizophrenia. I know you're not. And so we have to be able to separate that out, that you are who you are. This is just something that you have. This is something that you live with. This is just a diagnosis. And you are not your diagnosis. You are certainly are not your diagnosis. And I think that's one part of it. And then the other part of it, and I think it's where you're heading to, is when we talk about when we, and that's the reason why, I know most people are not going to do this, but if you go to the Hebrew word, if you look in the old, as you look at the old language there, um, 
there are some situations where, yes, this was used as a tool to get your attention. Um, this is where some. This is what. This is exactly what God was trying to do. God was trying to get Saul's attention. All right. Saul was. He was in trouble with God, and this is one of those instances where God was trying to get his attention, and he brought it upon himself here. All right. That is certainly not the case with probably more than more commonly that you'll find. Uh, you'll find today, like we talked about earlier, where people just have problems. They're, they're born into homes. They're born, they have situations where uh, those issues move from latent to patent to blatant. Um, and, you know, it has nothing to do with them. Most of the people who, who have problems today, nine times out of ten, probably don't even know God. You know, so no, it's not God punishing them or, or trying to get their attention, uh, but th that can be the case. When we talk about the evil spirit, uh, yeah, that doesn't mean that you're evil, because stuff happens, good things happen to bad people all the time. All the time, good things happen to bad people. And uh, I, what I try to do when I'm dealing with somebody who will come in, uh, especially me, because I, I do do faith counseling, when somebody comes in and they have a disorder, they have a diagnosis, and they sort of see this as, you know, a punishment from God or see this as something evil. One of the first things I try to do with them is God is God just does not operate on that level. He does not. He's not looking, oh, I'm going to get you. He just does not operate on that level. He's way too busy to be, you know, trying to, he's not a punisher. He's not a punisher. He is not a punisher. If he's chasing you, he's trying to tell you that he loves you. That's what he's chasing you for and that he cares about you. Uh, so that's one of the things I try to do. Another thing I try to do when I'm dealing with a patient like that is I really try to help them sort of separate that out to see that, you know what, stuff like this happens to people every day. And they have no control over it whatsoever. No control over it. So, yeah. Um, and we and we do have to be careful with uh, with um, even with our our terminology that we use in clinical settings, especially uh, pastoral counseling. You know, because we come from that background where and, and and not to not to dismiss or take away from what as faith counselors what we do and what we can do in a therapeutic setting, but we do have to be careful with that terminology though, because that terminology people you know it's called neurologistics. You say one thing, but people interpret it totally different. They hear it totally different <laughs> is what they do. So you do need to be mindful, be able to read that body language when you say something like that and sort of watch a person's body language to sort of pick up to see if they really understand what you're saying. All right. Okay. I hope I answered that. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, that's where I think that if you are, it, let's just, let's take a, a hypothetical situation where you are not a faith-based counselor, but you are a professional, okay, who is working with somebody who has faith. I'm a strong believer that if you look at the numbers, um, and I'm going to come to this question, but I just want to clear, I want to do something first here. There's an article that came out um, about a month ago. Uh, it talked about why African American men don't go to therapy, uh, and uh, African American men don't go to therapy because uh, there's no, there's not enough African American men who are therapists. Uh, if you look at the numbers for therapists, only eight percent of us make up the male population when it comes to therapists. Only eight percent does, and so African Americans are even smaller than that. All right, it's like two of us. There's like two of us in the field, okay? So that makes it even more difficult then, all right? So I, I responded to this because they wanted to, you know, a professional sort of respond to it. And I, I really do believe that it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. It doesn't matter if you have faith or if you don't have faith. If you are, a, you know, not to say that you can't, but especially if you are a master's level clinician, which is typically what you need to be licensed, you can help people. It doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you are. You are a trained behavior expert. You can help people. And we train all of our providers to use a person's faith to help them get unstuck. And it doesn't matter what their faith is, to help them get unstuck and to be able to move forward. Now, with that being said, that it takes a lot of work 
to, to sort of deprogram a person and to root out what they've been hearing every Sunday and every Tuesday, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, that it's evil and that you're evil. It takes a lot of work to be able to do that. And I think you have to know what your limitations are and what you can do. And so if you educate, you train, it, takes a, it does take a while to deprogram. And that's, you got to root out. 20 years of, so it's not something that happens overnight, 20 years of, of, you know, dysfunctional thought process is what you gotta do. You gotta have that paradigm shift in their thoughts and help them sort of see themselves in the context of, you know, that they're not evil. And sometimes if you can't do that, then that's why we need to have that relationship with somebody who's within the fake community who provides these services, who can partner with you to do that. And, and I know one of those people, I don't think it's a bad idea for you to be seeing a secular provider and then to go see your, your half pastoral counseling done. Those go hand in hand. We should complement each other is what we can do. And then sometimes you have those p providers who not only have the science, but then they have the fake too, where they can, you know, that's a wonderful combination. And you even have pastors who have that, who have that uh, professional background and who also have that faith background. And that's a really nice combination. It's just not the norm. It's just not the norm. Normally when somebody goes to get help, they find somebody who typically doesn't think the way they think, who doesn't look the way they look. And there's something to be said about how that is important. That's a good thing, but it doesn't have to be that way though. You can get help from anybody, no matter who they are. So I hope I answered that. that it, takes, it takes a while to, to deprogram them, but I think if you, you help them, you know, that help them with that sort of shift, restructuring how they think about that, how they think about themselves being evil. Um, yeah, and it takes a while to do that. It does. It does. All right. Um, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so that, that's where I think, again, it just depends upon uh, who that uh, provider is within your limitations. Uh, that's where you need to be able to have, be able to refer people to get help to do that if you are a professional, uh, if you don't deal in that. And then there are some professionals who, deal, who do deal in that. Um, you know, I have a lot of that come, I see a lot of that, and I can tell you right now that nine times out of 10, it is not a devil. It is not, it is not a demonic possession. It's not. Can it happen? Absolutely it can happen. It does happen. It has happened, okay? But nine times out of 10 though, that typically is not the case. Uh, you have to have somebody who has certainly opened himself up to that world, somebody who has delved in that world. And then there are certain things that we do look for that this is not the setting for. There are certain things that we do look for to see if they meet that criteria. For again, we're talking about demonic possession, where now you have to have something along the lines of an exorcism or something like that, all right? Uh, but that's so, that's so far and in between. It really is so far and in between. Nine times out of 10, if you have somebody like who you, what we typically see and think is from TV. <laughs> so if you have somebody who's in a frenzy, you know, you know, talking in unintelligible, where it sounds like it could be glossia, a tongues or something like that, we think it's the devil. Uh, and I guarantee you, get them some Zyprexa, some Haldol, some Ativan, girl, they'll be fine. They'll calm down and be talking to you just like you're a regular person. It's, what, what happened is that there's like the, the, the brain is, is, is sort of being overloaded and I mean chemically everything is out of whack. Everything is out of whack at that time. And so when that does happen, people typically they go back, they sort of reach back is what they do into their life. And you'll see a lot of that stuff sort of play out into who they are. You have people who, you know, I'm the devil, you know, and things like that. And um, if you treat them, they're, they're not the devil. Yeah, they're not the devil. Yeah, it's a very small, very small, very small chance of that happening. So um, here we are. Let's uh, bipolar. Bipolar disorder is not defined solely by an episode of depression, similar to the ones that Saul had, uh, but there were um, also included experiencing unforeseen and extreme manic or mixed episodes 
during a manic episode, the patient can exhibit symptoms such as inappropriate behavior, bizarre speech, uh, again, which is when you have somebody sort of talking to you unintelligibly, you think that, you know, oh my goodness, this is a devil, you know, is what you think, because they're talking a language that you can't make out, you don't understand, you know they haven't been to any training to have a second language, and so bizarre speech, and, uh, and even an irritable mood, all right, where they're break, they're yelling, screaming, throwing stuff, breaking things, and can get to the point where they're putting your hands on, on people too.